Hello and welcome to a new episode of Nile Magazine. Today we have a lot of interesting segments, so stay with us. Our first segment is Story of the Week and in it I'll be continuing my interview with Dr. Francis German, the Professor of Intercultural Communications. As for the science page, in it we will be heading to the National Research Center to learn more about its latest researches. Finally, in our culture review, we will be attending the music concert by Bandmakers. now is lecturer and professor of literature and intercultural communications as well as novelist professor uh, Francis German actually uh, this is the continuation of my interview with him uh, in the first segment we uh, discussed uh, why he chose to study literature and intercultural communications also we talked about his teaching career his interests some of his travels and now I'm continuing my interview with him well professor right now you're in Egypt and you're teaching a lecture or a workshop actually about the intercultural communications and actually in the paper here which talks about the schedule itself of it, there are various points which you'll be teaching to the students. So would you talk to us a bit about uh, your choice of uh, the topics discussed? Yes, it was quite difficult to make this program, especially because I don't know these students. I've never taught this particular combination of subjects in Egypt, so I had to guess about you know, which subject, subjects would be most useful and which level to to pitch it at. Um, I actually started with a lecture, not a workshop. First of all, I gave a lecture which focused on the historical and theoretical background to this discipline, which is new. I pointed out that it's an eclectic discipline, meaning that it takes elements from established disciplines, from history, social science, religion, and so on. A bit of a mixture. And this is a great advantage but it also brings disadvantages because every discipline has its weaknesses and all these weaknesses are built into intercultural communication. So intercultural communication as a subject is now rather like an adolescent child. It hasn't grown up completely and like all adolescents it's awkward, causes a lot of difficulties, it's not quite sure where it's going and it may be another 10 years or so before things settle down. Professor, actually, uh, some of the points are quite interesting that we'd like you to brief us on in them. Like, for example, mentioning the advantages and disadvantages of intercultural communication, because usually we tend to always speak about bridging the gaps and the advantages of it, but we never tend to think about the disadvantages. Yes, the disadvantages, I don't think there are any disadvantages to intercultural communication. There are disadvantages if you don't do it. Yeah properly. And these disadvantages are if you get a particular intercultural situation wrong, you will make it worse. It won't go away, it will actually get worse. And the other disadvantage is that things may become very, very expensive. Because intercultural communication is a subject which has been developed mostly in the United States through the business world, through the private sector, and through the activities of governments. And these areas of um, business communication, trade, commerce, and diplomacy, these are all very, very important areas where mistakes can be expensive. And if you get it wrong in intercultural communication, it can become extremely expensive. I gave the students one or two actual examples. Um, I pointed out that, for example, the um, it's estimated that very few business negotiations between Japanese and Americans actually succeed. The estimates vary from 1 in 3 to 1 in 25. Probably the truth is closer to 1 in 25, which sounds very bad, I know. And many companies, the lower figure exists because many companies, when they fail in their negotiation, don't publicize it because they don't want to lose face. Doctor, would you tell me about your feedback about uh, the workshop, or this workshop, please? Well, um, we're still continuing. We still have an afternoon ahead of us. The feedback has been quite remarkable. 
I have been mobbed by the students at all, at all turns, and not only by people who, who want to take selfies with me or something like that, but also by people with questions. They have great intellectual curiosity, and they have, they're under the false impression that I'm some sort of walking encyclopedia, which I'm certainly not, and they're asking me questions connected with disciplines in which I have very, very little, little expertise. So all I can say is, I, I'm sorry I don't know, and perhaps suggest where they might look for, for answers to these questions. There is, a, there is a hunger for knowledge here, that, that is clear. And I, I hope that I've woken in some of them a, a curiosity about some of these issues and some of these problems, and that they'll go away and they'll, they'll probably go on the internet rather than buying books. They won't know which books to buy, but they will go on the internet and they will find interesting things there. Well, we've been f uh, to Egypt ten times, two as a traveler, eight as a lecturer and a professor. Now, would you tell us more about your experience in Egypt as a lecturer and how do you find the, the, the level of uh, the education here and the students? Well, I find it mixed and this is how I tend to react most of the places that I go to. That in all universities you have really good people and you have some really bad people who shouldn't be there, who shouldn't be studying, and you have a lot of people who are not quite sure yet, who are young people who are finding their way, not quite, they're not quite certain which direction they want to go to. Sometimes they don't know whether they're interested in your subject or not. I hope in the case of intercultural communication to be able to interest almost everyone who's been in the lectures. I think only only a fool would not be interested in this subject or would not appreciate how important it is. And I, I notice in the reactions of the Egyptian students a lot, great deal of interest and a lot of um, fascinating questions, some of which I can answer, some of which I can't. Now, when I was reading your biography, Professor, you wrote, or it was written about you, that you met the goddess and you sat on, or, or almost on a snake, isn't it? And you met, you know, now, it sounds a bit uh, mythical for, to me, so would you tell us more about it? Were these really real goddesses and so on and so forth? Yeah, well, this comes about because uh, when I travel, I don't like traveling as a, a tourist, hiding myself away in the uh, luxury hotel and not eating the local food and so on. I tend to, to like to wander about. I like walking around in strange cities. I like meeting people. Uh, I like curiosities. I go to s strange places, sometimes obscure places in the mountains or the desert that tourists wouldn't go to. Um, the, and and those, all these funny things happened to me. You know? I was traveling by train in India and the train was attacked by bandits. It was like something from a Hollywood film. And the bandits went through the train. They held up the train at gunpoint and they went through the train robbing the passengers, taking their watches, their cash and so on. But they didn't rob me. And the reason was I wasn't traveling in first class or second class. I was traveling in third class with the peasants and the robbers didn't bother to go there because they weren't expecting to find anything. Well, you were quite lucky. Well, also, I'd like to ask you about um, the most memorable adventure you've passed through. Oh, that's a question you should have asked me to prepare my answer in advance. You know, off the cuff, ad hoc, I'm not sure. I've had lots of little adventures, lots of exciting little things. I've had no nothing very big. Um, you, you mentioned the goddess. I'm not sure that that was an adventure, but this is a uh, this is a girl who is chosen in Nepal, in Kathmandu, to be the goddess. They believe, they believe, that she incorporates the goddess until she reaches puberty. And then when she becomes a woman, she ceases to be the goddess and they go and look for another one. But during the time that she is a goddess, I say, with inverted commas around the word goddess, uh, she's kept apart and worshipped and it's very difficult to approach her. And I wanted to meet her, and the only way to do this was to pay a bribe to one of the priests. And the priest organized this for me, and this was a charming little girl aged about nine years old, ten years old. And she spoke a bit of English, she, she was quite clever and well educated, and we had a very short conversation about, I'm not sure what we talked about, maybe food or the weather or something like that. But it meant that I could say, I have met a goddess. 
We had casual conversation not with just her. As a, sorry, not just as a compliment to a beautiful woman, but a real goddess. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting because I thought that that was metaphoric. Did all these adventures you passed through pave the way for you to become a novelist? Mm, yes and no. Um, I've always wanted to be a novelist. I didn't have the courage. One problem if you study literature is you read all the great books, you read all the great novelists, and the better you are at your subject, the more you realize how good these people are. You stand in awe of them, and it makes you depressed, and you think, I could never write anything like that. There are still moments when I read a novel, for example, a, a great novel, and I stop and think, oh, wow, I wish I could write something like that. That guy is a genius. When, when, Shakespeare, when Shakespeare writes in Macbeth about the milk of human kindness, this is an abs a metaphor of absolute genius. This has been pointed out by other people. Nobody ca comes up with such metaphors, which are so simple and so true, and you stand there speechless in admiration for things like that. And that held me back from writing novels for a long time, because I thought I'd make a fool of myself if I did. Finally, I'd like to ask you about your dreams. My dreams uh, are very modest ones. World fame, Nobel Prize, no. Uh, my dreams are about um, continuing to be healthy, to be active. I, I don't like sitting around doing nothing. Um, I'm working on my second novel, second full-length full novel in this series that I've started. I'm about a third of the way through and I've got to the point where I'm not sure about the plot and all writers have problems then when you're not quite sure which way the plot is going to go. But I get ideas all the, sorry, I get all the ide ideas all the time. So. Well, I wish all your dreams come true and I wish you the best of luck on your novel. Thank you very much, uh, lecturer and professor uh, Dr. Francis German, for this interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it here. Joining us now is Dr. Ahmad Fakhri. He's an emeritus professor of spectroscopy at the National Research Center, and we will be learning more about his researches. Welcome, doctor. Well, actually, that's quite an interesting, and it's, in, I think, in Egypt, relatively a new type of uh, department. So would you tell us more about the researches held here at the National Research Center in that field? Actually, it is, uh, it is not an exceptional case because uh, spectroscopy mm -hmm. is one of uh, the 